scholars. I'm Philippa Strum. I'm the director of the Division of U.S. Studies. And with my colleague, Blair Rubel, who is in the back of the room um, and who directs um, the, our program on comparative urban studies, we are delighted to welcome you to this program on creating communities of hope and opportunity, the revitalization, revitalization of East Lake. And before I introduce our speakers, I want to say a word about the Wilson Center because I know that for some of you, this is your first time here. The Wilson Center was created by Congress in 1968 as the living memorial to Woodrow Wilson who some of you probably know remains the only president of the United States to have earned a PhD. And Congress very wisely decided instead of putting another building up on the mall to commem commemorate President Wilson, that it would create a living monument. And so pulling together the two parts of President Wilson's life, the part that was a political scientist and the president of Princeton University before he became a politician, and then the part that was governor of New Jersey and president of the United States, the Wilson Center was created to bring together policymakers and scholars to talk about matters of substantial interest to both. And that's what we do. We hold over 600 such meetings a year, and we are delighted that this will certainly be one of the outstanding of those meetings for this academic year, because we do think in terms of academic years here, on this extraordinarily important public policy issue, the revitalization of our urban areas. We are extraordinarily pleased to have such a distinguished panel with us today. We have passed out to you a sheet of little potted biographies because you don't really want me to sit here and recount these people's distinguished careers. That would be extremely boring. I will just tell you that we have, um, starting all the way on my left, we have with us today Thomas G. Cousins, who is the founder of the East Lake Foundation and the person um, for whom this project was a gleam in the eye once upon a time, and now it has very happily come to fruition. We have the Honorable William Hudnut, who is now associated with the Urban Land Institute, but as Lee Hamilton, the president of the Wilson Center, would say, but he's the former mayor of Indianapolis, and that's what really matters, anything <laughs> Indiana and being most important to Lee. We have the Honorable Shirley Franklin sitting directly to my left, the mayor of Atlanta, which is where, of course, East Lake, East Lake is. We have Charles Knapp sitting to my right, the chairman of the board of the East Lake Community Foundation. Uh, we have Vernon Jordan sitting all the way to my right, um, Vernon Jordan now of Lazard Frere and Company. And sitting over behind the, the podium, we have Mary Rashid from McKinney and Company, from whom you will be hearing shortly. So what we are going to start with is a video of East Lake, just so you can see the project that we will be talking about. Um, please continue your eating. That's one of the reasons that we're having a luncheon conversation here. We want you to have um, food for the stomach as well as food for the soul and food for the intellect. Will you start the video, please? Thank you. In the early 1990s, Atlanta's East Lake neighborhood was one of the worst in the country. It was known as an area that even police officers and firefighters and, and uh, sworn officers of the law were not comfortable to be in. There was no sign of hope or community consensus around having a healthy community. It was the most deplorable housing project that I think has ever been built in the United States. 
It had a $35 million a year illegal drug trade, a crime rate 18 times higher than the national average, chronic unemployment, and a failing school where only 5% of the fifth graders were able to meet state standards for math. It's a life that I'm telling you, 95% of America would not believe existed in this country. It just, it, I cannot imagine. Well, they say you want to see the worst, go right out here to East Lake. Some residents remember what it was like to live in East Lake back then. You just see so much violence, people fighting, people hanging on the street begging for money. It was miserable, very miserable and scary. Today, Atlanta's historic East Lake neighborhood is a shining example of how people of all ages, incomes and backgrounds can come together and build a great community. Violent crime has been reduced by 95%. Ten times more adults are earning incomes over the poverty line, and 78% of all students at the local charter school met or exceeded state standards for math. A different approach to redevelopment has not only changed the look of East Lake, but the lives of the people who live there. Well, they, they tore down hell and they build heaven, and now we are living in paradise. Because education is key to breaking the cycle of poverty, the East Lake model includes cradle to college support. An early learning program for infants through preschoolers helps make sure children start grade school ready to learn. The local K through eight charter school emphasizes high academic achievement and character development to help students prepare for a lifetime of learning and success. The ultimate goal for East Lake is a great community. And East Lake has exceeded, I think, all of our expectations. So how do you transform a neighborhood from this to this, just about every city has a neighborhood whose residents deserve better. In Atlanta, real estate developer and philanthropist Tom Cousins had a vision to break the cycle of poverty and restore hope to the people of East Lake. He created the East Lake Foundation to help lead a different type of revitalization effort. And these were all strange ideas until Tom Cousins came along and was willing to take on the risk uh, of an entrepreneur. He expected to do something that was exciting and creative, that demonstrated that it was possible for black and white, rich and poor, to live together in a creative, productive, and harmonious environment. And I think he succeeded. The mixed income housing model is a key reason why we've been successful in Eastlake. The foundation partners with residents in the Eastlake neighborhood, uh, institutional partners like the Eastlake Family YMCA and Drew Charter School in the villages of Eastlake to create the kind of community where every single family has an opportunity to excel and achieve. We do this in a way um, that focuses on working with families and not doing things for people. What happened in this one neighborhood can happen anywhere. Hundreds of visitors come to Eastlake each year to learn about this approach for community revitalization. In response, the East Lake Foundation is sharing its five steps for transforming neighborhoods. Step one, select your neighborhood. Virtually every city in the country has a neighborhood or neighborhoods that are in desperate need of resources to help families in those neighborhoods rejoin mainstream American society. When you look to find the neighborhood that you'd like to focus on, uh, look for the right scale. Look for a neighborhood where you can make a reasonable investment and know that it'll have impact. A strong community needs, first and foremost, great housing, great schools, great recreation, economic and cultural diversity. It needs a vision for itself in terms of how it will grow and prosper and care for itself. Step two, identify a champion. Make sure your team includes a real champion, someone who's a true visionary who can articulate the team's goals and objectives and build consensus throughout the community. This person needs to not care who gets credit for the initiative. This person needs to be someone who is fearless in the face of controversy. A true community can only be built through collaboration. Collaboration is incredibly important. And it's much easier said than done. But it's absolutely important that this be a collaborative process and that ideas and information and decisions be shared throughout the team who's participating in this endeavor. 
The planning team should include residents and representatives from organizations like the local housing authority and schools, as well as nonprofit neighborhood and religious groups. I didn't ask for a million dollars. I just wanted to make my children's life a little bit better. So I was like, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And can I be a part of it? Once you set the goals for your initiative, establish a nonprofit organization with a strong board of directors to keep everything on track. I think in any community that considers a project like this, a group like the Eastlake Foundation Board is, is essential. There really are two levels of activities that our board is involved in. One is the traditional uh, responsibilities of a not-for-profit foundation board where you're involved in finance and budget and long-run strategic planning. We have a number of members of the board who are terrific door openers, not just in Atlanta and in Georgia, but nationwide, which really assists our philanthropic effort. Step three, define your initiative. Many community revitalization projects focus either on housing or education, but you need both and more to build a strong community. The two components of housing and education are inseparable because I think if you look at why so many educational reform efforts have not been successful, it's because they have not followed the children home. And if you are living in horror, it's very hard to be focused on education or other types of things. Great, healthy, sustainable communities aren't built around one element. In Eastlake, we've incorporated great quality housing that serves families across a very broad range of incomes. We've created a great school that serves families who had been underserved historically and attracts people with choice to the neighborhood. We've created great recreational amenities, great quality of life infrastructure like shopping centers and banks and stores and restaurants, the kinds of things that everyone needs and everyone wants in their own neighborhood. As you assemble your team, take time to identify your community's strength. What's special about your neighborhood? This can serve as an organizing theme that everyone can rally around. Eastlake used its historic connection with golf. Memphis used music. But it could be anything from a tennis center or theater to a university or park. Look to see what other people are already doing good work in that neighborhood and whether they would be amenable to a partnership. Look to see all the different kinds of assets that are available and build on those. Step four, create a funding plan. Of course, an initiative this complex needs a sophisticated funding plan. For example, if you're looking to do housing, talk to your local real estate developers, both in the for-profit and non-profit arena, to learn about resources like low-income housing tax credits. With regard to education opportunities, talk to your local school board members and find out what initiatives are already planned in your community. Talk to your state board of education and also talk to educational management organizations, both for-profit and non-profit. With regard to community planning and community programming, consider partnering with someone who's already a proven stakeholder and a proven fundraiser, like the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club. They can bring resources as well as programs to your community. And you have to be uh, willing to leverage the private sector. This is really a role that the Eastlake Foundation Board helps to play. You have to go looking for private investment, too, in the neighborhood. You've got to be relentless about private fundraising. You've got to go looking for every grant application you can find and every philanthropist that's walking down the street. Now that we know that it can be done and how it can be done, almost any bank, any corporation, uh, could take on this idea in any community uh, and make it work. Uh, the model is there. The barrier has been broken. Step five, make the commitment. The final step in this process is the most important, and that's to make the commitment for the long term. Every day that passes is another opportunity wasted. Feel that sense of urgency and start today. These five steps are helping change lives for the better in the Eastlake community. Imagine what you can do for your community. Select your neighborhood. Identify a champion. Define your initiative. Create a funding plan. And finally, make the commitment. I didn't think I was going to make it. And now that my kids have grown up, and they're talking about college and 
but when I look at everything I have, it's hard to believe because I made it happen. Seeing the children in the East Lake area, you see them now with a smile on their face, they've got hope in their eyes. That, that to me is the biggest payoff. To support this effort here in East Lake or learn more about how to get something started in your own community, visit our website at eastlakefoundation.org or call us at 404-373-4351. Tom Cousins, and uh, I want to first. I want to thank the Wilson Center for putting this uh, luncheon together and giving us the opportunity to to tell you a little bit about about our project. I want to thank some others. Uh, obviously, the the, the 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 panel. Terry Golden, who's one of your civic activists, served on the board of my company, my public development company for many years, finest director any company ever had. Renee Glover is over there who is head of the Atlanta Housing Authority. And yeah. And we've dealt with federal agencies and housing authorities for over 50 years across America. She is the top, the top of the list. If you could just figure out how to clone her, we wouldn't have any problems in housing. <laughs> Carol Norton, who's executive director of the foundation, is here, and of course you know about the, the panel. I, I think the fact that, uh, and she's being recognized nationally now, our mayor, Shirley Franklin, is such an incredible, I mean, our whole town is abuzz and growing, and it was going backwards for the last 30 years until she got there. Uh, the fact that she would come and serve on the panel, each of these panel members uh, shows the significance to them to take the time, busy schedule, <coughs> and come up here and do this. So I thank them all. I'm not going to speak more so much about East Lake. You've seen it on the, the film, and uh, uh, others will give more of the detail, but for I think it's interesting, a little bit of history. Why did we get into this? I cannot tell you. I've been asked that question a thousand times. And I'm always uh, amazed by it. Now, in the beginning, friends and businesses, business folks would say, why are you doing this? And uh, uh, even the people we were trying to help, the lady you saw, Eva Davis, who said, we took down hell and built heaven. She is, she is an incredible person and fought us for years. But when we finally reached agreement, she and her ACLU lawyers who had participated with her in probably 300 meetings, they turned to me and said, why are you doing this? We just don't know why you're doing it. We, you know, like they thought we were trying to get the land to build office buildings on or something, you know. It's, maybe you get asked that question sometimes, but the answer is, it's not me doing it. There's a lot of great partners, the Housing Authority, the public school system, the YMCA, a number of major corporations who joined in and contributed, and then our family foundation. What's the purpose of the foundation? I try to explain to people, I mean, we're supposed to give our money away. <laughs> and I mean, we found a good place to do it, you know. It's not hard to give money away in a spot like this. But yet people still ask, why? And so I've sort of reflected on that, and I thought I'd tell you, maybe it would, it would give some credibility to what we're, what we're doing. Much of my life's experience, I, as I think back on it, had really prepared me for this. Uh, following the Air Force in Korea in 1954, I came to Atlanta, went in the housing business in 1954, for most of you were born, uh, and as a salesman, 1958 as a home builder. And uh, frankly, and I'm not going to preach, but I was trying to be a Christian, and my old preacher told me, he said, son, you're supposed to tithe. All of you have been to church and read the Bible know it's, it says you got to tithe. Well, what is that, doctor? 
you got to give at least 10% of your time, 10% of your earnings. <clears throat> and that's, that's in the Old and New Testament many times. So anyway, I started tithing time as well as uh, earnings, and that took many forms. I served as a big brother. I bet some of you have served as big brother or big sister to some inner city kids. Uh, I, I solicited money for the YMCA and the Salvation Army and all those things all of you have no doubt done at some point. But the largest and earliest effort was in urban renewal housing. I don't know whether how many of you will remember following World War II, this country passed some of the most incredible legislation, urban renewal urban renewal and across America slums were torn down and uh, what a great idea and I'm sure it had some success but the incredible opportunity that, that was missed is what it really gets to me. Slums were cleared I keep countless thousands of slum dwellers were relocated into nice new homes and we built over a thousand. No down payment, 40 years subsidized interest, and beautiful three bedroom, it sounded like, but my, this long time ago, three bedroom, bath and a half, brick home for 9250 to 9850. Less than $10,000. The payments on those homes were a good bit less than what they'd been paying to live where they'd been, what they'd been paying the slumlords in rent, and they had their own home. Oh, we were so proud of these houses. My wife, Ann, who is, uh, is an artist, she just spent a lot of time color coordinating them, and landscaping. I mean, these were beautiful homes and beautiful new developments. However, a few years later we went out there, at three or four years, and we wanted to cry. They were slums again. So, you know, we concluded, I just don't believe there's anything can be done. Uh, you know, it, it's certainly, for sure, a new place to live is not the answer. You know, and we keep trying in this country, trying that is the answer. Well, get rid of that and let's build something new for them. Uh, but the, so what, okay, we, so we've, we've done that. We're not, we're going to forget about slum dwellers. And it, certainly we don't know an answer to it. So then we started spending time on prison reform. The hopeless cycle of somebody once locked up in prison, do you know what happens to them? They get a graduate degree in crime. They learn how this one got caught, how that one got caught, who what worked, what didn't work. They come out of our prison system <coughs> thoroughly trained to be a little bit harder to catch next time. We go through all the expense of catching them, retrying them. Now the few that would want to go straight, having had that environment, Who's going to hire? Who's going to hire ex-convicts? And you know, we found that to be a problem right away. So being very bright and wanting to be a good little social worker, I made one of our companies hire 20 ex-convicts. In fact, it was the Omni Arena company. The manager fought me and everybody, but anyway, they worked for me, so they had to do it. They <laughs> He came in a month later and threw the keys on the table. Says, I'm out of here. He said, that bunch you sent down there, everything that's not nailed down is gone. They're stealing pocketbooks, they're stealing computers, and this, that, and other, and I'm, you know, we're through. So anyway, the, that experiment failed. So next bright idea, next in the early 80s, we offered the state of Georgia would take 100 first-time offenders and we would build a private, our foundation, along with a partner, a major computer company controlled out of, we would build a private prison. 
We'd take 100 first-time offenders, but what we were going to do is going to be different. We're going to educate them, those that can't read and write, going to learn to read and write. We're going to teach them skills. Control Data had agreed they would put an in-prison floppy disk factory. We'd teach them how to make floppy disks. We'd pay them money into a savings account so that when they got out, they'd have something more than $10 to stay out of trouble. And Control Data was, would guarantee them a job. So now we got this whole thing figured out. Well, we asked the state, not any capital, but just what you spend housing and feeding your prisoners. We'll take that and we'll make up the difference. You know how much that was? We could have put them in the Ritz-Carlton for what we pay as taxpayers. And if you want a shock, if you don't know in your own state, you go find out what you pay to house a prisoner and do such a good job of teaching them how to be a better, better criminal. Well, that one failed because the bureaucracy blocked us. Our Department of, Con uh, of Corrections is a, is a constitutional body, and we even had the, the governor leaning on them, and no way, you stay out of our nest. They don't want anybody to fix the prison. So they don't want to know a better way. They just want to keep building more prisons, have more jobs, more patronage. So finally, you wonder, what in the world has this got to do with East Lake? We finally come to the conclusion, okay, we can't change. We can't change the existing criminal. Our system, which doesn't mean the way that it is, but it will see to it. You can't, you can't change that. So if there's any hope of containing and ultimately reducing crime, we need to get to the children before they enter the world of crime. So we worked with and funded boys and girls clubs, summer camps, after school programs, and for the first time we could see some results. There was a reduced conversion into crime from the young people. Uh, so we got a little hope. About that time, it's 1993, I read an op-ed piece in the New York Times about a serious study that some foundation had paid for to, f to study the prison population of the entire state of New York. Where, what was common with each prisoner? What was common besides drugs? It was anything they could learn by looking into the background of every prisoner. And the published report, they were surprised to find that 74% of the people in jail throughout the entire state of New York had come from eight neighborhoods in Manhattan most of which, incidentally, were public housing projects. Well, I was shocked. I said, my gosh, we've, we've, we've fixed neighborhoods. That's been one of the other things we used to do. We'd go in a bad neighborhood and we'd get it turned around. So, you know, you could, if you could fix those eight neighborhoods, would we be able to tear down three-fourths of our prisons instead of keep building more and more? I called the chief of police in Atlanta I was excited. I said, Chief, I got to tell you about something I just read. I want to, I want to send it to you. And he said, what is it? And I said, and I told him. He said, oh, Tom, everybody knows that. <laughs> I said, they do. I didn't know it. He says, everybody knows it. That's where he said in, in the state of Georgia, he said, I bet it's not over five neighborhoods, and they're all in Atlanta. I said, where is such a place? I, I can't believe that. And he said, well... The worst one, we call Little Vietnam. It's East Lake Meadows, a 650-unit public housing project, which you just saw some pictures of. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you know, when you think about it, I guess we all do know this, don't we? we? You know, you will not go in certain areas of your town at night and the reason is there can be some bad folks in there. I suppose you, you grew up in a place like that. 
In those 650 housing units you saw, there were 14 male head of household. You know, no family structure. Lots of grandmothers, lots of grandmothers in the 80s. The average age of the grandmother was 32. Countless children on the streets who had no choice where they were born. So you cannot fault a child. And on the streets, because police said, look, as long as they stay in there, we don't care what goes on. Open, on the streets, it's open drug dealing. I mean, folks around town would drive in there and pick up the drugs and drive out. They wouldn't stay long. And I just thought, if I had grown up in a place like that, without discipline and love of a family structure, and I got, I bet you, at least three spankings a week, and I still got in some trouble, and I had a mother and father who were strict, and I thought, had I been born there, there's no doubt in my mind I'd been in prison somewhere if they could have caught me. <laughs> The CEO of DeKalb County, who was on the film you saw briefly, publicly stated at a Chamber of Commerce meeting that 82% 82, 82 of all the crime in DeKalb County was coming out of that one place, out of East Lake. Chief Administrative Officer George Berry of the City of Atlanta back then said that it was averaging a murder a week. Didn't even make the newspaper anymore. And again, if you were a child and grew up in that kind of circumstance, what chance would you have? Now that's the long-winded answer as to why we undertook East Lake, with the primary goal of creating a model, and this is what we told the Wilson Center many months ago, you know, this is worth replicating. We've created a model for what could be done all across America. The answer was not new housing at East Lake. The answer was not job training, which we did. All our welfare folks that are not crippled work now. It wasn't a good recreation program, spiritual training, or even a good education. It's all of those, it's not one of those, it's all of those, plus another critical piece, role models living in the apartments. Every one of our welfare families lives in between two working families. Kids see the next door neighbor get up and go to work, take care of the property. They wouldn't be there if they didn't want to be there. In other words, they come almost foster parents. But we call this a holistic approach. Each piece is vital, and it's the synergy of the whole that produces the miracle. Now briefly some statistics. Violent crime, and that's defined, you know, felony, murder, rape, robbery, uh, has been reduced over 90 percent in that area, not, not just the little public housing we're not aware of one, not one, of our kids, our school kids. We have a thousand a year in our, in our own school. Not one dropout of high school. The state of Georgia, it's over 50 percent. And these kids are, should be the primary ones that would be dropping out. Not one. We've been involved with over 3,500 kids and that includes the kids in our schools, that includes the pre-K school, the K through eight, the golf academy, the caddy program, the old golf club, the summer camps, YMCA program, count, count them all. Now this is a miracle. Not one of the 3,500 has gone to jail. There's more in Buckhead, fancy North Atlanta, where I live, than more than one that are in jail. And they have parents, and they have wealthy parents, and they have great schools, but there's not one child 
there were 54 police districts that made up Atlanta. They call it something different now, Beats. Atlanta was number 54 by some margin. And in, uh, in the year 1994, Atlanta was number 54, wide margin on number 53. It's moved up to ninth. It is now safer, according to Atlanta police, than where I live. Property values, and, and you need to listen to this. You wonder, gosh, how could you afford to do something like this? Property values for miles in all directions. It's like a big rock dropped in a pond, and the waves have gone out. Property values, housing, new housing. Haven't been a new permit for housing or renovation in 20 Five years in that area. And can you imagine that? It was that bad. And today, it's written up in Atlanta papers, there's a boom going on out there. Housing boom, renovations, new houses. Property values have so dramatically escalated. If we'd had the, the patience and had set up a TIF, everybody familiar with TIF, Tax Increment Financing District? The difference in the taxes in 1994 for this area and what they are today, we could have paid for the thing three times without any contributions from anybody. Anyway, if this concept were, were to be carried na nationwide, I just cannot imagine how many hundreds of billions of dollars of savings in the federal and state budgets building new prisons. Paying cost of a prisoner thirty thousand dollars a year every year. Anyway, a few things that have brought tears to our eyes just this year, just recently, there was a citywide contest, science math contest, from all the public schools, all the North Side Atlanta, all the public schools. Guess who won first? A Drew Charter School. One of our kids won first place and third and fourth. We're fast becoming an embarrassment <coughs> and hopefully a stimulant to the public school system. Two of our, two of our first little golf academy kids, they, 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 uh, we started a golf academy 10 years ago also, First two kids that went into it never seen a golf club. They just got golf scholarships to college. They're in college because they got a golf scholarship. The first of either extended family that ever been in college. In fact, I don't know that any of them ever graduated from high school. So finally, our, our primary goal now is to see this happen around the U.S. It is happening too slowly. Now we've had. Hundreds of visitors. Maybe that's short. It's more than a thousands. Hundred, thousands of visitors. All want to see the miracle of East Lake. And they just brag about it and whatnot. Then they disappear. We don't see it happening. Uh, and I, you know, I won't tell you the few places they are, but it's just a drop in the ocean. And to see the waste and see the pain, it just breaks my heart. I'm 75. And before I die, I want to see this taking place across America. And we'll do all we can to help. We have money, we have experience, we just want to help. And in this room are some people that could make that happen. And I just hope you will. Thank you. So I met Tom Cousins and Carol Naughton last summer, and um, I am a consultant, McKinsey and Company, um, so I'm therefore very data-driven and very in love with PowerPoint. So you'll see that I'm the only person today who brought PowerPoint with me. It makes me feel more comfortable. Um, but you know, as I, as I think about when I first met Carol and Tom, I thought to myself, wow, these are very passionate people. And Chuck as well, and the and the whole team that we met at East Lake. These are very passionate people, and it is just wonderful that they have such passion for this community. And I wondered to myself, and I ha I never told Carol at the time, but I had a little bit of skepticism in my mind. You know, is this too good to be true? Can it really be worth it? What they did and the amount of money they spent and all the effort that they went through, could it possibly be? 
And there has been nothing more inspiring for me personally than to see that the facts and the figures and the numbers tick and tie and verify and prove that this really was an unconditional success, that the East Lake model is viable, that it's real, and in the work that we did, we actually went through and made comparisons to other holistic and non-holistic community redevelopments. And what we found is that it's not just Eastlake that has been able to do this successfully, which gave us even more hope and even more evidence that this could be done in other places. So Tom's vision and Tom's desire to see this roll across the nation, you know, it's, it's very possible. It's not just something that was done in Eastlake and has never been done or seen anywhere before. Um, as we think about what it took, what it took to do this, here are the sort of key elements. Um, that were involved in the East Lake redevelopment. It was mixed income housing, and as Renee spoke, the, the inc mixed income housing is not enough. It has to come along with educational transformation. And this isn't just a little reform of let's get in a couple new teachers or buy new school books, but it's a real reform of the education that happens in that community. When you marry the two together, you get the students who are going to the school, and you get to keep the same set of students. In schools where you transform just the school, but it's not tied to the community, the level of turn of the students every year through the school body really minimizes the impact that you can have in just fixing the education. If you just fix the housing itself, um, and we looked and built reference classes of other developments, if you just fix the, edu if you just fix the housing itself, the impact you get on reducing crime can be significant. But we didn't see any other significant impacts that just fixing the housing can have on the community. And so the level of sustainability and the level of value that you get by really approaching this from all aspects, from the holistic view, as Tom was saying, really dramatically increases the level of success that you can have. So here's the, here's the facts. And this is based on a set of holistic and non-holistic redevelopments. Um, the dark green, green bar that you see at the top of each of these is Eastlake. And what we're looking at here is the change in performance of Eastlake, and the brown is other holistic revitalizations. So this is a reference class of four revitalizations that we were able to find good data on so that we could compare them. And those were um, the villages of Eastlake, Centennial, Centennial Place, which is also in Atlanta, and underwent a transformation that started around 1994, Murphy Park in St. Louis, and City West, which is in Cincinnati. And these four were, were defined as holistic because they really did encompass both education and mixed income housing, along with several other community features um, that were all in play at the same time. Our non-holistic community revitalizations um, were communities like Soulsville in Memphis, um, Lake Park Place in Chicago, Harbor Point, Park Duval, um, Lexington Terrace and New Holly and a lot of these actually really did intend to be holistic they had several of them had plans for education um, and somewhere along the line lost the funding or weren't able to bring their full plan to, to completion and what we see too is that some of them never intended to be completely holistic and they wanted to revitalize the community they wanted to reduce crime but didn't have as far-reaching goals so they were successful in their own right at the goal that they set out to achieve but if you compare the whole impact on the community, what we see is that, um, is that aside from crime, in every other dimension that we looked at, in income, in property values in the surrounding area, in reading um, improvements, uh, and other test scores, the, the impact of doing a holistic <coughs> improvement is just dramatically different. And when you actually try to quantify this and put social estimations of value, if you look at what's the value of an incremental person graduating from high school, what's their lifetime earning difference, what's the like, increased likelihood that they go to college, what's the value of that? And you multiply those things together, and then you look at the, the value of the, of the taxes that can be collected <coughs> on the improved property values in the areas. When you add all of these things up, the value of going all the way and doing the holistic approach, what, like what Eastlake attempted to do, is really significant and dramatic um, and very much worth the time. Um, you know, if we, if we kind of think about the conclusions that we drew from this, and um, I was very tempted to actually pull 30 slides of the value of Eastlake because there's just so much compelling data. And so what you'll see is 
actually outside on the table, there's a pack um, of, of this data that you can take to arm yourself with the facts of what worked for East Lake and some of these other communities so that you can take them and use them in the conversations that you're having with other people about this. But the points we'd like to leave you with um, in terms of the impact that we saw are that yes, the revitalization of the community was an unqualified success. Even the numbers-based skeptic me um, comes away and just avid supporter and advocate of East Lake and of other communities who are attempting to do the same thing. Key driver of the success was the holistic model. The difference of including versus not including education and other community features in the redevelopment has a significant impact on the value it can create for the community and for the sustainability of it over the long, t over the long haul. Thirdly, the model can be replicated. There's three other examples of where this was done with a, a wide degree of success across all of these features. And they weren't all done the same way as Eastlake was done. They all took slightly different approaches. So this is something that's flexible, that can be adapted to multiple business or to multiple community situations. It wasn't just the Eastlake golf course that made this really successful. It was the people who were involved and the passion and the commitment and the ability to bring all the pieces together. But it can be done with different elements and with different people. And finally, the lessons that Eastlake learned, that were learned from Eastlake and other revitalization programs can be applied to others. So we should take the learnings from Eastlake and from Centennial Place and from all the other ones that we know have been successful and look at the things that they learned and take those approaches out to other folks who are trying to do this so that Tom's vision of taking this uh, to the rest of America can really, can really come to life. short enough not to be able to see over that. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad to join you today. I'm Shirley Franklin. I'm uh, in my sixth year of mayor of the city of Atlanta. But prior to that, I, I worked um, with the East Lake Community Foundation for two and a half, three years. I'm the first chair of the charter school board. Uh, I also was in, engaged in the communications of this message um, uh, really the hard work of Renee and Carol and Tom and others in really uh, developing consensus in the community uh, by opening lines of communication. So I come to this both from the standpoint of having been in the trenches when they'd actually been in the trenches longer uh, and using my um, experience in politics and community organizing uh, to um, assist in the, the buy-in, so to speak, of the immediate community. In addition to that, now I am the mother of a child uh, who's in his 30s, who when he was growing up in Atlanta, um, and when I started talking with him about what was going on at Least Lake, he told me no way in the world uh, would he move uh, to that part of the town. Everyone in the city knew that it was unsafe, and now he's the happy three-year anniversary homeowner, um, five blocks uh, from what was Little Vietnam uh, and is a member of the Y. Uh, so here is a child who um, just a decade ago uh, had very little interest uh, in being an urban pioneer, but he moved in this community because the benefits are far broader um, outside just of the project itself as we're defining it into four or five blocks out. And he's particularly happy uh, that the equity in his home is growing so fast as a first time home buyer and that he can be a member of the Y uh, and that his daughter and wife and everyone uh, experiences this benefit. Uh, so I see this from three different points of view. Number one, having worked with the community with Tom and Renee who really are the, and Carol who are really the pioneers coming in and adding uh, some of the political um, strength that I'd had from being in politics a long, long time in Atlanta before I ran for office in 2001. And then finally, seeing East Lake now through the eyes of a 30-something-year-old who frankly uh, is successful enough in his life he could have chosen to live in many different neighborhoods. Uh, so what I see from my perspective looking back is that with a lot of hard work and vision, persistence, 
a fair, a fair level of uh, flexibility because the negotiations with the community, the negotiations with HUD, uh, the negotiations with the, the, the mayor at the time and the other political leadership uh, and the other community leadership were not easy negotiations. So I would throw in, in addition to the other um, aspects, that this was a group of people who were determined to overcome all of the obstacles, which meant that for me, the partnership aspect of making this happen is important. People gain trust early uh, and a willingness to step out on a limb to make this happen. So I'll give you just one or two statistics and then sit down. 72% of all adults receiving housing assistance in the villages work compared to 65% of all Georgians. That's an important statistic. In, uh, since 1997, the villages of Eastlake, just the villages, not my son, because he'd be glad to tell you that he plays healthy taxes over there, um, and his mother has a lot to do with setting them, um, uh, that the villages of Eastlake has paid over $2 million in property tax, was not paying any tax before, and that doesn't even speak to this rounding neighborhood three or four blocks away. Um, the average sale price of a home in Eastlake in 1996 was $45,000. Uh, the average sale price in that community now uh, is upwards of $176,000. Uh, so revenues have increased with the increase of property tax. Uh, the crime rate, which is an important piece uh, to remember, uh, this was the most violent place. I was the chief administrative officer of the city of Atlanta. I drove a city car, uh, unmarked car. Uh, I worked for Andrew Young. It was the only community in Atlanta when I worked for Andrew Young that I would not drive in by myself. Uh, the crime rate was so high. And in fact, it is reduced, violent crime has decreased by 95% in this community in five to six years. And what's even more phenomenal about that, that this community has led uh, the entire city in lowering crime, which is a high level uh, priority for me. So there is no question in my mind that um, uh, this is a project uh, that has uh, some sisters uh, and brothers uh, in other parts, of, um, uh, other parts of the country, but it is certainly a model that is beneficial to the people who live there, beneficial to those who are investing, who want to see results, and beneficial to the overall community in which it is situated and comes highly recommended from my three uh, perspectives. Thank you very much. I, um, I have, I'm fortunate to have two assistants, one in Washington and one in New York. Uh, yesterday, my assistant Jean in New York said to me, why are you taking the 930 shuttle to Washington and the 230 shuttle back to New York? And when I got here, my assistant here, Gail, said, why did you come down on the 930 shuttle and why are you going back <laughs> at 2.30? There are three reasons. Uh, the first is Tom Cousins. Uh, Tom Cousins is a very dear friend of mine and a visionary, and he represents the very best of the South. I love the South, and Atlanta is home for both of us, and, and he got me involved in this project. There was, there, was, there was an old saying somewhere that there is no end to the good that can be done in the world if the person doing the good does not care who gets the credit. That is the definition of East Lake, and that is the definition of Tom Cousins' life. If you go to East Lake, you don't see Cousins written anywhere. No road, no creek, no bush, no <laughs> nothing. There's nothing there about Cousins. There is no end to the good that can be done in the world if the person doing the good does not care who gets 
the credit. He just wanted to make something happen, and he did. The second reason for being here is that my favorite mayor in all of America is here, and that's Shirley Franklin. Now, she has a lot to do with that great big city down here, but she is here because, as she just told you, she cares about this project. She knows about it. She cares about it. She cares about Tom Cousins. She loves her city. And so she is not doing her duty. This is extracurricular duty that she's doing by being here today. But I'm here to be with the best mayor in, in, in these you United States. The third reason for being here is that Atlanta is my hometown. I grew up in the first public housing project for black people in this country, University of Homes. It still stands. It's right near the Atlanta University system. That's where I grew up. And, and I'm a beneficiary of the institutional strength, the schools, the church, the YMCA, uh, of, of that community and, and, and the leadership of, of, of that community, I stand here on their, on their shoulders. So years ago, when Cousins called me and said, you got to come help with Eastlake, I said, OK. So we had a deal. I would invite CEOs from around the country to meet Tom and me in Atlanta at East Lake. And we would feed them and play a round of golf at East Lake. And then after the round of golf at East Lake, we would take them to Augusta and then feed them again, fried chicken. <laughs> and the next day, they would play 18 holes of golf. By the time we were at the third or fourth tee, they had signed up. <laughs> we wanted $250,000, then $50,000 to join East Lake, and $200,000 for the East Lake uh, Foundation. And that's how we did it. And Tom and our partners, I got them. And we put them on East Lake first. They liked that. But the thought of going to Augusta <laughs> was sort of the sort of the key point. And and I was I was cousin's chief recruitment man. I was a con man and it was great. <laughs> and we used his membership and friendship at Augusta to seal the deal and that's how we got a a goodly number of companies to join. The ultimate meaning of this East Lake development took place when Tom and I were there just playing a game of golf. And we were making the turn at the end of nine holes, and we stopped to get some refreshments. And a youngster came by, and he said, hello, Mr. Cousins. And Cousins said, hello, young man. He said. You don't remember me, Mr. Cousins. And Tom said, well, tell me about it. He said, I was in the first golf academy at East Lake. And I did well. And the East Lake Foundation got me a scholarship to Morehouse College. He said, I'm now a senior. I'm third in my class and I'm on my way to medical school. There is no end to the good that can be done in the world if the person doing the good does not care who gets the credit. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for including me with all these distinguished people, it's really wonderful to be up here on the dais with so many fine persons. The reason that I came is because Woodrow Wilson used to be a good friend of mine. <laughs> well, he wasn't a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, I'm a lot older than you, Burden. 
<laughs> I did go to Princeton, which helps, I guess. Um, I know several of you are wondering about this, and uh, if I have to leave early, suffice it to say it's to go to the other guy's funeral. <laughs> I want to pick up on uh, a theme that I think is very important, and that is um, the mixed use component of all this, or the mixed income. You go catch your plane. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. It's an honor to be with you, Dr. Jordan. Thank you. I want to pick up on the theme of mixed income housing because this project, if I can't call it a project, this development dispels a lot of the myths about mixed income housing. What are those myths? Well, the first one is that it won't work. High income residents just simply won't live near low income residents. Well, the fact is that all through American history, they have lived near each other. And there's been a blend of incomes, and East Lake demonstrates that new developments can achieve some the same kind of compatibility between market rate and, and rental with their range of housing types and their price points that accommodate different needs. Uh, the second myth that I think uh, East Lake uh, villages dispels is that only government and nonprofits uh, do mixed income housing. It's obvious that's not true from watching this, this program. It's obvious that for-profit organizations and foundations that spin off from them can indeed produce fixed income housing in many wonderful forms. And this is a class A example of that. A third myth is that affordable housing is unattractive and a blight on a community and as we could see from the pictures that were shown, that's not true either. Mixed income housing developments help raise the standards for good design in affordable housing, providing appealing residences that blend into the surroundings. We saw the townhouses uh, that were illustrated there. And it, it simply is a myth that this kind of housing, mixed income housing, is unattractive and will blight a community. The fourth myth that I think is worth mentioning is the myth that moderate income housing uh, is going to be solved by the marketplace and that it can meet the demand. But that's not true, especially in this day and age when income levels are going up a little bit and the cost of housing is going up much more. The marketplace needs help, help to supply enough housing, especially for working Families, there are millions of working families in America, according to the National Housing Conference. At the end of the last decade, it was like 5 million. Now it's much higher than that. I read yesterday, somebody said it was 14 million. Conrad could tell us, because he's right on top of all those figures. But the point I want to make is that for working families especially, there is a need for this kind of housing. Mixed income housing can alleviate the need by providing housing that is safe and livable and attractive and close to places of employment. And that's what East Lake Villages is all about. A fifth one, a fifth uh, myth is that you can't get financing. Well, that's not true. I mean, look, look at this. And the story here, which we haven't had time to go into, is one of cobbling together a group of different uh, sources of funds, some nonprofit, some for-profit, uh, and some governmental to make all this happen. And the return on the investment, according to the statistics that are on the table out there, are that for every, that there's a $3 return for every dollar spent. And that's, that's kind of astounding. And there's a social return, too. But I'm talking about the financial return. So it's a myth that you can't get financing for this, if you work at it, which you've got to do. I think also there's a myth that this kind of uh, development brings down property values around it. That was alluded to already by uh, Mr. Cousins. The fact is that mixed income housing has been found to have no negative impact 
on adjacent properties, according to studies that have been run by the Urban Land Institute, where I work. And as a matter of fact, in this particular instance, there's been a $44 million appreciation in values of property around East Lake Villages. And finally, seventh, I only had seven minutes uh, to do all this, so I'm trying to take a minute for each one. Uh, <coughs> the NIMBY thing, community opposition, is insurmountable. That's the myth. Well, it is very true that oftentimes a NIMBYism and uh, opposition to a project can defeat it if indeed it comes to a vote by public officials. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it seems to me, that mixed income housing can be an appealing option <clears throat> that lends itself to community acceptance. I mean, all I have to do is listen to that woman say, we used to live in hell and now we live in hev heaven. Or we're going to heaven and now we live in paradise, whatever it was. <laughs> as, as she said, that's good. So <clears throat> my, my view is that with quality design and higher income people coming in maybe first, and a main, an effort to maintain diversity and enforce certain standards, no graffiti on the walls and that sort of thing, and this holistic approach that we have a model here that can indeed be replicated if the will is there to do it. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about tithing. Well, I happen to be an old broken down Presbyterian minister by professional training. And uh, I picked up a story a long time ago when I was in college in New Jersey about a fellow named Father Divine down in uh, Philadelphia. 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 And he, when he passed the offering plate, Tom, he said, now I want you all to tangibilitate your faith. <laughs> <laughs> and what we have to do here is tangibilitate our faith. The heartache comes for people like Tom and maybe some of the rest of us when we give a presentation like this, and everybody says that was nice, and nothing happens afterwards. It's got to happen afterwards. Um, I was talking with uh, Mayor Franklin about the possibility of bringing a group of mayors and private sector developers together to view that project, maybe to go down to Augusta and to, uh, <laughs> and to uh, go back home, to resolve to tangibilitate the faith. That's what we got to do. We got to have the political will, we've got to have the private sector will, and the nonprofit cooperation in order to make this possible. And I would hope that Tom, who has spoken to several meetings of the Urban Land Institute, could come back because we've got the premier developers in the country in our organization. We've got 32,000 members worldwide. And I would hope that somehow he could light a fire that would keep on burning and not go out after everybody's applauded him and gone, gone home. Ron Terwilliger, who's known to the people from Atlanta and was chairman of the Urban Land Institute a couple of years ago. I'll let him have the last word. He's the um, national managing partner for Trammell Crow Residential. Just uh, gave us at ULI a $5 million grant to set up some housing uh, centers in two or three different areas of the country to attack the problem of affordable housing. But Ron Twilliga said, and I quote, and this is coming from a very successful private sector businessman. Ron Twilliga said, we all agree that the policies of the past, particularly the public housing policies of concentrating the poor were a mistake for our society. And that what we need to do is find a way to have these families, whether they be minority or majority, dispersed throughout our society. And East Lake Villages is a story that is doing that, and uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to be here to learn about it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm, uh, I'm Chuck Knapp, and I'm the chair of the Eastlake Foundation. Uh, relative to a lot of other people up here at the, at the uh, front of the room, a relatively uh, newcomer to the, to the Eastlake Foundation, I've chaired the foundation for a couple of years. I was actually, uh, when Tom 
first dreamed the dream about Eastlake, I was uh, at the University of Georgia, and I remember one day, uh, as I know a lot of you are thinking about this issue right now, you're thinking, this is nuts, we can't do this, there's no way this can happen in my city. Uh, I remind Tom from time to time of the irony of me now chairing the Eastlake Foundation, because when he first suggested the idea to me, I guess uh, 13 or 14 years ago at a lunch, uh, he went through it very carefully. I was familiar with uh, with uh, East Lake Meadows because uh, the the old golf course was still there, and on occasion they'd play benefit golf tournaments for the University of Georgia golf team there. And I remember you could hear automatic, not weapons fire, automatic weapons fire going off in East Lake Meadows while it was just a continuous stream of police cars and ambulances. And he described all this to me, how he was going to do this, and I said, Cousins, you have lost your mind this time. It can never, ever happen. So here we are 13 years later, and I'm a, I'm a, a uh, enthusiastic convert to, uh, to Eastlake and the fact that it can happen, and it can happen in your cities as well. Uh, I'm going to be very brief because I want to leave some time for questions. There was one issue that I thought of as we were discussing, as the discussion went on, that we didn't talk about that I, I think we should. Uh, it is great to have increased property values in the East Lake neighborhood. The question, uh, I'm a, I'm, Bill said he was a broken down Presbyterian minister. I'm a recovering economist from a long time ago. And, a, and an issue that uh, that comes to mind as you think about those increased property values is gentrification. And I think that's a, it's a good issue to talk about for just a minute because it shows that one of the elements we haven't discussed is that Eastlake is an ongoing process. It's not like, you know, we did the DVD so now it's over and, and we can just let it kind of coast and be on autopilot because uh, through Carol's work and others at the Eastlake Foundation staff, we we deal every day with fine-tuning and continuing to move things forward, and the gentrification issue of the neighborhood is one of the things that we, we deal with. Eastlake as a neighborhood is not gentrified. Property values are way up, a lot of different kinds of people, different demographics moving into the neighborhood. But if you look at Drew Charter School, we still have uh, uh, over 80 percent free and reduced lunch at Drew Charter School out of the 800 plus students that are there. So that'll give you an idea of the demographics of the neighborhood, and, and, and there are ways to deal with that issue. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the layout there, across from the villages on Glenwood Avenue, the foundations have now purchased a good bit of property, and, and the target for that property is low, moderate, I guess what we now call workforce housing to put into that neighborhood to make sure that it doesn't you know, East Lake uh, 100 years ago was the vacation destination for people from Atlanta for the summer. They came out to East Lake, out to the golf club. Uh, we don't want that to turn back into that kind of neighborhood. We want it to be a healthy, mixed income, mixed demographic neighborhood, and that's what we're aiming for. So we're dedicated to making sure that we don't, uh, that, that the neighborhood just doesn't, just, just doesn't gentrify. And, and there's a whole set of data on, you know, questions like did crime just move elsewhere in the city and so on. Uh, McKinsey uh, looked at that when they were in, when Mary and her group were in uh, last year. And a lot of that, I think, is in the report that she left out on the table. You can look at that or we can respond to it in the questions. The, the key issue that has perplexed us has been this, uh, a couple of the speakers have mentioned, is this call to action uh, issue. Uh, Tom describes doing an altar call one time with, uh, with a group of businessmen who had just given him a standing ovation and saying, now, that's fine, the standing ovation is nice, but do you, you know, how many of you are going to do this in your neighborhood? And that's really what we'd like to do is get people over the threshold and, uh, and say, what can I do? I know the, looked at the backgrounds of the people in the room, and let me just make a couple of suggestions to you. If you're in the legislative or executive branch, uh, th there's a lot that you can do to make this kind of project easier. Uh, I've worked in the federal government too, and the federal government, much like academia, I tell you, is arranged in silos, and the silos don't talk to each other. So the programs <laughs> tend to be captives of a committee on the Hill or an executive agency. And we've got to find ways to break down those barriers and to get that level of cooperation. Now, the HOPE 6 program 
is one of those programs that allows that to happen. And I think you're all aware that that's really been a piece of legislation. It, it post-dated Eastlake, but it has caused a lot of good things like this to happen around the country. And I'd encourage you to think of that as a piece of legislation that can really be very helpful to projects like this. Uh, I'm not supposed to endorse any legislation today, but I'll tell you that there is a bill up there right now by uh, Senators McCleskey and, uh, and Martinez, I believe, that I think would be a helpful tool for projects like, uh, like Eastlake. And I'd encourage you, if you're involved in that, to think about it in, uh, in those terms. If you're from a foundation, uh, don't support projects that just do housing or just do education. Uh, when I was in the federal government, I was involved in the job training programs. We were focused on job training. We didn't want to talk to the education people. We didn't want to talk to the housing people. We just wanted to deal with job training. Uh, support things that are cross-cutting, that our term has been a little bit overused today, holistic in terms of, in terms of their approach and projects, uh, projects like this. So I'd encourage you to think of things in those terms. And each of you can have an effect on whatever group, foundation, think tank, legislative, executive branch agency that you're involved in, in those terms. Well enough, uh, we've got a few minutes uh, for questions and I'd be glad to try to moderate if we need it. If not, just everybody's got a microphone in front of them and please address the questions. I'd also encourage you to address questions to Renee Glover, who's over here next to Carol, as Tom said, without the continued Again, the process goes on, the continued support of the Atlanta Housing Authority, we wouldn't be able to accomplish what we have at, uh, at Eastlake. But let me open the floor for, uh, for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm curious as to what the unit mix was at Eastlake in terms of public housing, premium public housing residents versus market rate, and what your, in your experience, what that, that threshold is where on one side it's going to be successful, on the other side maybe it won't be in terms of that balance. Carol? Uh, the, the mix right now is 50% public housing assistant and 50% market rate, and that's every building. So you can't tell based on where somebody lives, what floor they're on, what size unit they're, they're in, whether they receive a rent subsidy or not. Um, in another world, I might, I might not go up as high as 50%. My own view is I like the 40-20-40 mix a little bit better, 40% public housing assistant, 20% tax credit, and 40% um, market rate. I think it works a little bit better on your financial structure, but I think sociologically, the folks at the bottom rung see a, a place where they can move up in the community that doesn't require them to get all the way to that market rent. But, but I'd like to respond, because I heard this story, and I don't know if anyone will tell it, but it was really the public housing leadership that required that 50-50. So to the extent that something looks better on paper, in order to get the buy-in, you have to have some level of flexibility so that yeah. you can get the local leadership to buy in. I think that's fair to say, right? So it was Miss Davis who said, not on my watch are you going to do anything other than 50-50. And in order to bring her along, that was a part of the settlement. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm Conrad Egan with the National Housing Conference. This is my colleague, Mike Brennan. And I, first of all, I'd like to pledge our support. I'd like to extend the discussion a little bit that you began about next steps. You, you offered a couple of observations. I'm wondering if the panelists, maybe others in the group here today, have some observations on what uh, additionally we might we might do uh, at the federal, state, and, and local level to grow many more of these models. Tom, do you want to you want to try that? Well, I'm probably a pretty, one, a pretty poor one to try it because I've been trying. I cannot tell you how many thousands I've spoken to. And uh, as Chuck said, I mean, literally, you know, you show the film. I mean, we've had other films that are less focused than this on how you can do it, but just showing a lot of what it was and what it is and getting some of the statistics and, and honestly get standing ovations. People just think it's wonderful. The International Developers uh, Convention in New York, 5,000. Who should have been a better target than that? From all over the world. Standing ovation. And they'd come up and give a card, send us a video, send us information, and 
Lord knows how many thousands of videos we've sent out. I cannot trace one project. And I've been, I've been personally very discouraged about that that's the way. I mean, they're not going to convince them that way. I think we've almost, I don't, I don't know, I'd love to have some further advice about it, but uh, there's a good one, a good one really beginning in Memphis, which they did, it was mentioned on tape, is they've done around music. That was the home of soul music. And they've done a beautiful job. They built a museum. They built a, initially a, a, a school of music. So all these little kids run around on the streets with nothing but trouble to get into. And they all in there learn how to play the violin and the trumpet and the drums. And, and they've developed a symphony, a children's symphony that I would put up, maybe not the New York symphony, or, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, beautiful little kids playing beautiful music. Now these are kids that are going to have something, a hobby, they're going to have a way to make a living, they got something to be proud of, and that is just so, so obvious. But there was a leader, a person, that personally drove it. I think that's the key, if I may just add that word. Uh, Conrad, finding a champion. There's a saying that God couldn't be everywhere, so he created mares. But, then, <laughs> but uh, mares can't do everything, public officials can't do everything, and often when I was mayor of Indianapolis and we tried to get a project going, you have to find a champion, maybe in the nonprofit sector, maybe in the private sector. It's interesting that. Mr. Cousins explored his roots a little bit and uh, the kind of motivations that he had. And somehow it's nice if you can find somebody who's done well in the private sector, who has the social conscience that he has and the uh, moral commitment to uh, getting into this with both feet and, and continuing. And maybe that was true in Memphis. I'm not familiar with the yeah. Memphis situation, well. but you need, you just plain need a champion, somebody that's on fire with this and will make it work. And uh, there are such folks around. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's lucky when you find them. We had, uh, for example, uh, in Indianapolis, we built a $300 million retail entertainment complex downtown. Basically, it was by for-profit developers. Melvin Simon and his brothers did it. Uh, but we, we found a champion there in an unexpected place because he didn't like to be out in front on many things. The chairman of the board of Eli Lilly and Company. We were $75 million short on putting the financing together. We brought everybody around the table like this at his invitation. He stood up and he said, uh, we're going to put $25 million from our pension fund into uh, this project. Uh, what are the rest of you going to do? And to make a long story short, about $75 million was raised, and we were able to, uh, you know, find the bridge financing. And these people that put up the money got a preferred rate of return and became limited partners and with Simon, who was the managing partner, and all the rest of it. But it never would have happened without Dick Wood, the chairman of Eli Lilly, being a champion for it and believing in the city and believing that this was important. I want to take a stab at that because I think it's it's really a central issue to this nationalization question that we've been talking about. I mean, we're we're really past the point where I think obviously you've got a bunch of true believers here. I think we've also got the data now to show that this works. Uh, and I think there was a point at which we believed that if if it was a really good project, that it just kind of a natural osmosis would take care of it and it would flow out over the country. Uh, as Bill suggests, that's not the case. And, and what we've done strategically in our, in our instance is really turn to a very retail kind of approach where we are looking at finding those champions. Uh, mentioned the Memphis. Uh, we're also now involved in uh, Jackson, Mississippi with Jackson State. A different, it's, you know, everybody thinks, gee, we can't do this because we don't have the golf club where Bobby Jones hit his first shot and his last shot. Well, you don't need that. 
Jackson State has a fine historically black university there, and we're, we're helping them design a similar project around, uh, around Jackson State. We're very active with a group in New Orleans, a uh, similar type of issue in the post-Katrina effort there. Actually does involve golf. It's around City Park and, the, and, uh, and, and revitalization of housing and amenities and schools around the City Park in New Orleans. What, what you can do if, if, if we're looking for action steps is help us isolate those champions. Do you know somebody in a city that you're involved in that would be interested in undertaking a project like this? I will tell you, if you do, uh, we're from the East Lake Foundation, you know, when I was in Washington, we used to say, we're, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help you. We're from the East Lake Foundation and we're here to help you. Uh, we can put on a great tour, uh, but we also have the technical assistance and even in certain uh, instances resources to help cities undertake projects like this. But we want them to be not exactly like, nothing will be exactly like East Lake, but to mirror this comprehensive, uh, comprehensive approach. Renee? Discussions locally with the new deputy mayor for economic development in the city, and I used to wear that hat a few years ago. So I just want to say, it just brings some encouragement that that we are we are beginning those discussions here in the city. So, you know, this might apply, and that, that that the forums that you are providing, Mr. Cousins, are not without are not in vain. And we, we just hope to continue this dialogue locally and see what we can do. Because I think uh, I think the replicability in a city like this like this city would be a wonderful, wonderful yeah. movement for, for what you've already done. And we'd like to invite um, people who are here to, to join us um, in a tour of the city to look at some potential sites that, uh, that uh, offer such an opportunity here in the District of Columbia. I think that's May 31st. May 31st. Yeah, 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 part of Terry. yeah, I was going to say, first of all, what a wonderful presentation. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and more than anything else, having a fact that with statistics, and you can really see that you really have a sense of uh, what you've been accomplished, uh, have accomplished. You know, as far as this Washington is concerned, you know, we may be one of your test cases where, where in fact we could follow through and see what's happening. We, we do have 
now an extraordinarily dynamic new mayor. Uh, he's on the verge of getting control of education uh, in, in the city, which is a, a helpful step, particularly when you're, what you're talking about being able to bring all the resources to the table under one tent and, uh, and, and getting a holistic approach. We do, uh, we've done a number of Hope Six. We probably lead the nation, but you know, thanks to Captain Graham and a lot of other people who uh, work, uh, work their, uh, their networks. Uh, and we have had good success in a lot of areas, but we still operate in silos, housing, public health, education, recreation, and the like. And we've brought parts of it together, but we've never really brought it all, all together in one place. And uh, there certainly is some energy on some major projects that we want to do. And you know, maybe with uh, some work together, uh, we can get our mayor and uh, the, the chairman of our city council and so forth together with you and see if we can't uh, all work together uh, on uh, being more holistic. I mean, even I'm, I represent the federal city council and even our committees are silos that reflect <laughs> the city. We're, you know, our, our priorities are housing, education, public safety, and neighborhood development. You know, and I'm, my first step is let's go back and retool it and have one, one group focused on all of it and see if we can't all work in that direction. So I think it was a very helpful uh, presentation. Maybe we can, you know, uh, take the challenge Tom had of not er anyone ever following up and see if we can, uh, in fact, do that. Mm. Terrific. Thank you, Terry. Yes, sir. I'm Blair Rubel here at the Wilson Center, and I'm curious if, if as you, as the story unfolded, it was clear that there were some pretty tough negotiations, and maybe even resistance, with people in the community. And I'm wondering what lessons did you learn from those negotiations? How was the program improved by uh, the participation and um, perhaps the skepticism of the community itself? How, how is the program different because of their input? Well, there's a, there's a hero that isn't here today, and that's Greg Giornelli, who was, the, was Carol's predecessor at the Eastlake Foundation that was really instrumental in those negotiations. But Carol was actually on the other side of the table with not the other side of the table, another <laughs> corner of the table, Renee, with the Atlanta Housing Authority. And Carol, you've got some scars on you from those negotiations. So. Well, um, I think there's probably Mayor Franklin and Renee can certainly um, add a, a lot of value on this, this point. But families in Eastlake Meadows that have been abandoned uh, by the government, by their churches, by financial institutions, by virtually everybody. Uh, a good friend of ours in Atlanta describes the neighborhoods that, in which we work as the kinds of places where everybody who has had a choice has exercised it and left. And so the folks who are there are there and they've got kind of a, a siege mentality and they're, they're, they feel trapped and they don't trust anybody because people from time to time show up and say, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help or I'm from a church and I'm here to help. And, they don't, they don't stay. And it's hard to stay. We were tested for a long time uh, by the residents in the neighborhood. They didn't trust us. We didn't know each other. Uh, it took a long time to build those, build those relationships. And I think the secret was to keep coming back, even, when, even if your last meeting was a disaster, even if, you only, if, if there was no conversation, if you're only screamed at for two hours, come back the next time anyway. Keep coming back. Um, I think everybody in the process is going to be working on uh, these relate on building relationships. Needs to be willing to make themselves vulnerable. Greg would bring his little kids out to East Lake Meadows from time to time to take a walk through the neighborhood. And when he did that, what a great example he set that he wasn't here just because um, it was his job. He was here because this was part of an important part of his whole life. And by bringing his children out there, he demonstrated that to the community by making our homes open and occasionally having somebody over for dinner or bringing a meal and having dinner at somebody else's home. I mean, we, we got to know each other on a very human level and I think that helped us get a very long way in the process. It wasn't ultimately quite enough to avoid some of the final power challenges at the end that ultimately were resolved in litigation. Um, but but it, was that, it was that process of, of being willing to take the time and honor the relationships and respect that even when it was really hard and painful for, for everybody. Just keep coming back. Sure. I, I was going to add that 
um, the negotiations were very tough on the housing development itself. But the negotiations on the charter school, the negotiations on the pre-child, the, the children's programs, those became very easy because the, because the negotiations, frankly, were protracted and they had developed some um, sense of relationship. So the charter school was a snap by comparison. I mean, one of the young women, Lucia Clark, that you saw was an original member of the charter school board. She remains a member. Her children are now aged out of that. Um, but she is still an active member of the board uh, and a m major contributor to um, the process. Uh, when, when we started the charter school, I mean, we, our tendency was, you know, we wouldn't have had uniforms. I mean, there were a lot of things. Um, but the, the parents said, this is what we need. We have low incomes. We have limited resources. We need a school that's going to run until 4 o'clock in the evening with a guaranteed after school. Otherwise, this is not going to work for us. So they added, you know, they helped us to expand aspects of the program. But the school, uh, the Y, um, the, 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 the shopping center that's developed there, I mean, all of that was relatively easy because, so that was a lesson learned. That even though that first step was really hard, um, once the trust was developed and, frankly, um, both sides followed up, the fourth, fifth, second, seventh, and tenth step are relatively easy. Not impossible. I mean, not, not, not wonderful in the sense you just walk in the room and it's done. But, I mean, you have a basis on which um, to talk. And the, and the parents and the families were intricate, I mean, very much involved in the design of all those other aspects. Let, let me just add one brief comment to that. I, you know, what we hope to do here was to, uh, to, to have, to be the model. And, and, and uh, I, I want to tell you, you, you'll run into some tough community opponents, but you'll never run into one as tough as Eva Davis. And I, I'm just telling you that. And I'm telling you, you see how Eva feels about it now. You could... You know, I guess we could bring Eva to your community leader. And when she tells them how she felt about it and how she fought us, even to the end, she and the ACLU or whatever they were called took, took the whole thing to court. And, and the judge, incidentally, we took, oh my God, he's going to that court. That judge is known to be, in fact, he was a former ACLU lawyer. So, you know, we're dead. This guy, you know. This guy read this thing, and he turned to Miss Davis and said, I can't, now, do I, do I, what are you doing? These folks are trying to do what? <laughs> and so, I mean, but she was just fighting, fighting. But I'm telling you, she could be a great testimony. She is. All aspects of this, we've been through it, and we want, and it should not ever be a fraction as hard to do again because you've got the example there. Here's the tax basis, here's the crime rate, here's all this, and here talk to the residents, the ones who fought, the ones who fought it, and the ones who did, you know, so forth. I'm going to let Renee have the last word. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, whenever you're going into a community, you have to listen. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't come there with all the answers, because all the answers, you don't even know what all the issues are. And you have to earn the trust. And that's why we had to keep showing up. And you have to do what you say you're going to do. Because if you go out there with some hidden plan that you're going to whip out and put on the table, you know, it takes time. And I think too often the reaction is uh, we got to do it quick and fast and in a hurry. But if you think about it, you're doing it from the long view. And the buy in is important. Uh, and you got to bring people along. And to do it the right way is, in fact, to do it the holistic way, because that's really the only way that it gets done. And think about what it is that you would want in terms of a quality community. This is not you know, creating something for aliens from Mars. We're talking about creating healthy communities. We're talking about great housing. We're talking about economic integration, and that's not a new concept. We're talking about great schools. Nobody wants to send their kids to the daily school. We're talking about great recreation. So a lot of this is common sense. And I think we've just got to stop treating people who have fewer resources as if they are a special species. You know, 
this whole notion of the universal humanity of uh, man is very critically important. And if you approach it from that perspective, and you respect, and hear, and listen, and then build on that, you know, there's really no obstacle that you uh, can't overcome. So if you think about it in those terms, it's very, very doable. And the models are in place. It's just a matter of working together and building community um, so that you have great outcomes, not only for the families who need the assistance, but for the city and uh, state as a whole. Thanks to uh, everybody in the audience for coming. If you can think about how you can make this happen in your community, this will have been a successful, uh, successful luncheon. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the Wilson Center and particularly Flip for sponsoring us today. Have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm.